evening. It's good to have the presence of each and everyone here this evening. The Bible clearly teaches that baptism, in baptism, the penitent believer receives remission of sins. In baptism, the penitent believer finds a new life in Christ. Paul tells us over in Galatians, the third chapter, in verse 27, he says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So those that have been baptized have put on the likeness of Christ in that we have, he had died for our sins and were is able to live as Christ having come out of this world. In 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, in verse 17, here Paul writes, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The Bible also teaches that those who have been baptized have the hope of eternal life. But we see that this hope of eternal life is conditional. It is conditional on our willingness to submit to God's will. No longer living under the will of man or our own will, but living according to God's will. It is, this hope is also conditional on our fighting the good fight of faith. Here Paul writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy the 6th chapter in verses 12 and verse 14. He tells Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. That that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He also goes on and tells us in Ephesians the 6th chapter in verse 10 and 11. He said, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And these wiles of the devil is the devil's schemes and his devices and his tricks in order to deceive us into doing the things of the world. And when it talks about putting on this whole armor of God, this armor is what we are to be equipped with because we're in a warfare, we're in a war against that which is evil. The Bible tells us that our loins are to be girded with the truth so that we are to, when we go into battle, that we have the truth on our side and that we fight with this truth. And that the breastplate of right righteousness and our feet are to be shod with the preparation of the gospel. So we should be prepared when we go out to fight this fight or this warfare that we are to fight against. And we are to carry the shield of our faith to help shield against those things that are wrong and these fiery darts in which that the devil will hurl our way in trying to deceive us and get us to do the things that we should not do. And we are to wear the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, and the sword of the Spirit being the Word of God. So we should do everything according to the Word of God. So what is it that we are to fight against? We are to fight against anything and everything that is contrary to God's will and to God's way of thinking. And what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time this evening discussing something that is taught over in 1 John, the second chapter, in verse 15 through 17, that we are to love not this world. And the first thing we want to look at is, what is the world? Well, the world is talked about in Scripture in three different senses. First of all, the world sometimes is referred to as this physical universe. 
And in Acts the 17th chapter and verse 24, Paul writes about this universe or this earth. Here when he is in Athens talking to the Athenians, he said, God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, he, he dwelleth not in temples made with hands. And I cannot convey that it be improper for us to talk about the things or the beauty of this world and for us to appreciate the world that God has created for us. When you think about the things like the rain that we received this, this morning, much needed rain that we need for our crops and for this earth to be replenished. And then think about the sunshine that come out later and how that it shines and helps things to grow. You think about all the beauty of this earth, some of the mountainous areas that you go to and the beauty of the mountains, the beauty of the seas. You know, sometimes I watch the Discovery Channel or these vacation channels and it shows pictures of the Hawaiian Islands and how beautiful these oceans are and how beautiful these mountains are and some of these caves. And you can see the beauty that God has set forth for us. And where we live, we live a little bit outside of town, and at night you can see all the stars in the sky and how beautiful that the nighttime is with the stars and the moon and how pleasant it is to see the next morning when you rise, the freshness of the morning that you see, and the birds singing and the sounds that they make and the flowers, the fragrance that you smell, all these beautiful things in this world that sometimes we take for granted. But you can look at the grandeur of it all that God created this universe. And he created this universe for our pleasure and for us to, to enjoy while we're here upon this earth. And you know, one of, the, one, of my most, one, of, one of my favorite songs, there are so many songs that I love that's in our hymnals, but one is the song, How Great Thou Art. And you think about when you sing the song, the words that describes this earth that he has created for us and the beauty of it. And it sometimes it helps us to agree with what the psalmist said in Psalms 19 and verse 1 when he says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. So this is one way that the world is used in Scripture. It's this universe that he has created for us. Another way world is described, it refers to the inhabitants of the earth. In John, the third chapter, verse 16, John writes, For God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we see that God loved all of mankind. And all of his creation. God even loves the sinners. We find over in Romans the eighth chapter or fifth chapter in verse eight, where Paul writes, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he loved the sinner. He loves his creation. And it is not wrong for us to love mankind as well. And we should love mankind. And it's not wrong for us to love those that are lost in sin. But sometimes I think we talk, sometimes you, when we talk about love, I think that we look at love a little different than what God talked about love. There was a friend of mine that I brought to services this morning. And he was telling me that he had been visiting around. This is this young man is, uh, if you haven't met him, you need to meet him. He is a little bit slow, but he is really interested in the truth, and he wants to learn the truth. And it would be good if everybody would take a an interest in this young man. He comes from a, a family that's a kind of a difficult family, and he's tried to branch out on his own. He is disabled. But he has been visiting around, and he's searching for God. And he's been visiting some of the denominations around the area. And 
I had spoken to him on several occasions trying to get him to come, and now then he's interested in coming. And one of the things that he pointed out in the denominations that he'd go to, he said it was hard for him to, him to get them to come pick him up because he didn't have a ride. And But he said when I got to some of these congregations, he said all they talked about was that how we're to love one another and how we're to be kind to people and this and that. And he said, but they never opened up the Bible. And they didn't talk about the scriptures and what the Bible taught. And I've had two studies with this man already. And he appreciates the idea of studying what the scriptures say. And he wants to do what the Bible says. So he truly believes that God's word is the way to salvation. So we need to understand as well that we need to teach everything according to scriptures. And I say I think sometimes because of our love that we have toward maybe our friends or our family members, that sometimes we maybe are too soft and we I'm not saying that we shouldn't be compassionate and we shouldn't love because we should. But you know, like Billy and I was discussing here a few nights ago that if you truly love somebody, if they're living wrong and they're in sin, you need to correct that wrong and not be so passive. Sometimes we kind of step around it and we think, well, if we come down too hard on this individual, we're just going to drive them away. And my, my concern is this, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't be compassionate because we should, and our whole attitude should be a loving attitude of wanting to restore that person but sometimes as we see in scripture you know a person had to be rebuked for the things that they were doing wrong this is showing the love that we should have for that soul because sometimes while we're being so soft and so passive and just waiting so long and trying to work so slow with individuals not saying that we shouldn't be patient because we should but time is slipping away and maybe we're losing an opportunity to point out in the scriptures what the Lord says and what is correct and what sin is and sin separates us from God and that it will cause us to lose our soul. And I would hate to say, think that someone I didn't tell them the truth even though it might hurt and then they lose their soul and then someday they ask the question, Keith, why didn't you tell me when you were talking to me? about this why didn't you go ahead and tell me and I say well I didn't want to hurt your feelings I wanted to spare your feelings but sometimes like Billy and I was talking if I'm doing something that's wrong that it's going to cause me to lose my soul and burn in a devil's hell you really would be my friend and you would show your love to me by correcting me whether I needed to be rebuked for what that was or just point out what it was or whatever way that it might need to be done. But we need to do this kind of love. The Bible talks about different types of love. One of these loves is filial love. And this filial love is a love that you cannot command. It is a love that is emotional. It is one that maybe that you have toward your, your mother or your father your wife or your husband it is a kind of love that is tender and it's an affectionate love and you cannot command this love yet but the Bible commands us to love one another so you cannot command an emotion but there is another type of love that is talked about in scripture and it's called agape love and this love is the type of love like what God had toward us that he was willing to send his son to die upon the cross in our behalf. That's how much he loved us. That's how much love that Jesus had for us and that he was willing to suffer this cross and to die in order that we might be saved. It's a type of love that if someone was shooting a gun toward my wife, that I would jump in front of that bullet to take that bullet instead of her. This is the type of love that is talking about here in the Bible. And this is the type of love that we need to have toward one another. 
if we're doing something that is wrong or sinful and they're going to lose their soul over this, we should have the kind of love in order to try to save them from that. Just like what you would your children when you try to guard them against any type of harm so that they won't be harmed by sticking their finger in a light socket or picking up a poisonous snake. You warn them against these things in order to save their life. And this is the kind of love that we should have toward those so that we can save their life, their souls, from a devil's hell. The third way that the world is talked about, it refers to the persons who live in reference to this life only. And this is where I want to spend some time is about this world that it's talking about here. In John, the 15th chapter, in verses 18 and 19, Jesus said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So once we become a child of God and we have been baptized into Christ, we have come out of the world. So we're now no longer living in this dark world. Now then we are separated from the world and we're a part of God at this point. And this is when the world sometimes turns against us. As long as we're in the world, they're happy with us. But then when we come out, then this is a threat to them because they're still in the world and they don't want to look as bad, so they're going to do everything they can to try to get you back in the world with them. And this is the things that the devil will do. We talked about this several months back, about if I were the devil, what I would do. The devil, if he cannot keep you from becoming a Christian, after you become a Christian, he's going to do everything he can to put you back in the world. And also we're taught that we're not to be friends with the world. We cannot have friendship with this world and be followers of Christ. If you would, turn over to the book of James, the fourth chapter. And here in the book of James, the fourth chapter, he says, You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So we cannot be friends with this world and without being an enemy to God. Jesus tells us in Matthew, the 6th chapter, verse 24, part of his Sermon on the Mount, when he says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So we also see that in this, the things that are in the world, that we are not to be a part of some of these things that are in the world. First of all, the lust of the flesh. Now not all urges and all desires are wrong within themselves. God has placed within man the ability or the desire to love, to hate, and to be jealous. And these desires are not wrong within themselves, but they are wrong when they go contrary to the will of God. The lust of the flesh is that is talked about here is evil desires of the flesh. If you would, let's turn over to the book of Galatians. In Galatians, the fifth chapter, and let's read verses 19 through verse 20. Here Paul writes, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murderers, drunkenness, revelings, which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So that we see that 
when we participate in these fleshly desires that are upon this earth that is considered the lust of the flesh that we cannot be pleasing to God and that we will not inherit eternal life in Genesis the third chapter in verse 6 we find that Eve she was taken by the lust of the flesh or the desire to fulfill her fleshly appetite in Genesis 3 6 it says and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave unto her husband that was with her and he did eat and we know the story of Adam and Eve and they were placed in the garden and God had told them that they could eat of any fruit in the garden except for this one tree that was in the midst of the garden and for this tree they was not to partake of but when Eve was tempted by the devil she saw that this was good for food and so she lusted after it, and then she partook of the fruit. Jesus also was tempted in this same way, that he was also a hungered, and he was tempted, but yet he did not yield. He had gone some 40 days without food, and yet the devil had told him to make these stones into bread. And Jesus replied, It is written, the man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so we see that he resisted. And it's not easy always for us to resist from the things that we are tempted from. But we're told over in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse 13. Here Paul writes that God will not tempt a man above what he's able to bear. But with every temptation, he will provide a way of escape. The problem is too many times that that way of escape God has provided, we just choose not to take that way of escape. But there is always a way. God has promised that he will not allow us to be tested or tempted above what we're able to withstand. And he's going to give us this way of escape. And sometimes maybe we are not looking hard enough for this way of escape and we need to try to look harder so that we don't yield to these temptations the Bible tells us in Galatians 5 and verse 16 Paul said then this I say walk ye in the spirit and you shall not, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh so we see that there are two things that Paul talks about here in this passage of scripture he talks about the lust of the flesh, and he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And everything in life that we are tempted with or any question that we might have, you know, is this right or wrong? Nine times out of ten, if you have to ask your question, is it wrong to do this, more than likely it is, and you ought to stay away from it. But if you can't make your mind up if it's right or wrong, turn to this passage of Scripture, and you look and see, will it fit under the lust of the flesh or will this thing that I want to do fit under the fruit of the spirit it will fit in one of those two categories and then we can decide if this is right or wrong and this would be an easy way to show us whether something is right or wrong Paul tells us in Romans the 8th chapter verses 12 and 14 therefore brethren we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many of you as have been led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. You know, sometimes we look at the lust of the flesh as some of the things that we obtain in life that we think so highly of these things. If you would, let's turn over to the book of Luke. And in the book of Luke, let's turn to the 12th chapter. And in the 12th chapter of the book of Luke, here we find Jesus speaking a parable. Let's look at verses 16. 
And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater barns. And then will I bestow all of my fruits and my goods. And I will say unto my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And we notice here that this man, what he did, he left God out of his life. And he wanted to have life easy, so he went after all the fleshly things that he needed, that he thought that that was what he needed to obtain, and that was what would make him happy, and that would sustain his life. And he would just take life easy after all this labor that he had put forth. But we see that his soul was required of him. Then whose things would those belong to? You know, any possession that we have when we die, we can't take it with us. It's just going to be somebody else's possession. And it'll pass on down and down and down. Places where we live, some of us that... Uh, I live out in the country on a few acres. Danny lives out in the country on acres. That was somebody else's farm years ago, and they died, and before that, that was somebody else's farm, and they live. It just passes on. Somebody else possesses these things. We, we never take these things with us. And the next thing we see, that the lust of the eyes. And the lust of the eyes, this is the strong desires of the eyes. And Eve again here, she was tempted of this when she saw that the fruit, it was pleasant to the eyes. And she yielded to that. And we see that Jesus, he was tempted also this same way by the devil. And he refused to yield. The eye is not evil within itself. But our eyes can behold the beauty of this creation that we talked about. And we can see the value in of our eyesight and our eyes and that the compassion that Jesus showed on all those that were blind when he healed the blind from their blindness so that they could see. Yet Jesus also warns us in Matthew the 5th chapter in verse 29. He said, If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not the whole body be cast into hell. So we must be in control and not let the desires of our eyes lead us into sin. So we need to be careful with, of the things that we see with our eyes. You know, sometimes our little children, they have this song, be careful, little hands, what you do. Be careful, little feet, where you go. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. You know, these teach a very good lesson for us all, that we need to be careful where we place our eyes, the television shows that we watch, the movies that we see, the trash that you can read in the grocery store while you're standing in line at the magazine rack. We need to be careful where we put our eyes so that these things don't, doesn't tempt us or lead us to sin. In Luke the 11th chapter, in verse 34, Jesus said, The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, the whole body is also full of light. But when thine eye is evil, the body is also full of darkness. And how true that is. Because, you know, when we're seeing with our eyes the things that we should be focusing on, then this is the things that we're thinking about and we're meditating in our minds. But if our eyes are full of these evil thoughts and these evil things, these are the things that we're meditating on and we're thinking about. And these thoughts can lead us into temptation, lead us into sin, where we might lose our soul. Next of all, we see that the pride of life. Here again, Eve, she saw that this would be a fruit that would make one wise. So this was a pride, thinking that this would make me wise as God's, is what the devil had told her. And Jesus, he was also tempted this same way. When he was told that 
when he was carried up on the pinnacle and he looked out at all the things the devil says, I'll give you all these things if you'll just fall down and worship me. Yet Jesus, what did he say? He said, get thee behind me, Satan. He said, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And see, this is a way that we can always, if we put on the Christian armor, as we talked about earlier, this will help us to guard against these temptations and these things and remember that we need to do the things according to God's will and not this world. Also, if you'll turn over to Matthew, the 19th chapter, there's another story that I would like to read. And in Matthew, the 19th chapter, starting with verse 16, And behold, one came and said unto him to Jesus and said unto him, Master, what good thing I shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest me thou good? There is none good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said unto him, Which commandments? And Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man saith unto him, All these things I have kept from my youth up, what like I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man had heard the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So we see here in this passage that this young man, he had much. And he, these things that he had, he went away sorrowful, the scripture says. And he was sad. The love of money was stronger than the relationship for him and Christ. And sometimes, you know, these, these passages are talking about those that are rich or those that had much. You know, sometimes we don't realize how blessed we are in this life. And in some parts of the world, and we are, everyone in here is considered wealthy because of the way that some of these others are in such poverty. And it doesn't mean that we have to have a lot of things, but where are we putting our priorities and our treasures? You know, it can be in our car. It can be in our homes. It could be our job. It could be anything that we spend more time in that than we do in serving the Lord. These are the things that are treasures for us here on earth. And sometimes we don't realize that we are putting all these things ahead of the Lord. But these are the same things it's talking about. You know, it's, we take pride in all the possessions that we have. And there's nothing wrong with having possessions. There's nothing wrong with having a nice home, a nice car, or anything like that. But where it becomes wrong is when we spend most of our time having to work to pay for things like this, or we spend most of our time possessing these things instead of doing things that would be able to put treasures in heaven for us. It is easier, Jesus said in Matthew 19, 24, he said, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of an eagle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And you know, it is so easy for us sometimes in all the possessions and things that we have that we forget about God. And we put God on the back burner, so to speak. And we think, well, I'm going to get around to that and I'm going to spend more time studying my Bible. I'm going to spend more time. I'm going to start visiting people more. Or I'm going to do this or that, whatever it is. But then we never get around to it. We procrastinate and we put things off. And when we do that, 
it's easier and easier for us to forget God and forget our purpose in life because we're so wrapped up and entangled with the things of this world that we forget God. Sometimes we become so busy in life, so busy working, whether it's around the house or jobs, just things that we engage ourselves in that we become so busy that we don't have time to serve God. We don't have time to read our Bibles, and we don't have time to visit the sick or visit one another in the hospital or just go by and visit someone to lend them an encouraging hand or an encouraging word. And we can be entangled with this. And our desire for wealth and worldly pleasure. Sometimes just the pleasures of this life, the little simple things, we spend more time in those than we do in serving God. How do we avoid this? First of all, we need to be humble. We need to humble ourselves unto God. And we need to be obedient to His will. Do the things according to what he would have us to do. I think so many times we become where we want to make God to confer over to our way of thinking instead of us transforming our lives and conforming our lives to his way of thinking. But in order for us to be pleasing to God and to ever be able to have heaven as a home, we're going to have to submit ourselves to God. The wise man of the Old Testament tells us this in Proverbs, the third chapter, verses 5 and 6. He said, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So we need to put our faith in God. And also we see according to 1 John 2 and verse 17, that the world passes away in the lust thereof. So this life, we're not to, Jesus tells us that we're not to put up treasures upon this earth that moth and rust does corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, but we are to put ourselves up treasures in heaven, just like what he told this rich young ruler. And if we do that, he that doeth the will of God will abide forever. We will live in eternal bliss with God in heaven. So the question tonight is simply this. Are you living according to the world or according to the will of God? And we need to look at our lives and examine our lives and see which path are we going down. Are we living according to God's will are we living according to what this world has set forth for us? And if you are here tonight and you in need of obeying the gospel, whether it be to become a, a child of his by being baptized into Christ, I would just add, say this one simple thing to you, the same thing that Ananias told Paul. Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. And maybe you're here tonight and there's sin in your life that you need to be corrected. Maybe you haven't been as faithful as you ought. Maybe you haven't been as good of a servant as what you should have been. We've been studying Christian influence. Maybe we haven't been having the right influence on one another as we should. Whatever it is that needs to be corrected, if we can assist you in doing any of this, we'd ask that you come now while we stand in some.